Hey everyone, in this video I'm going to be playing through another scenario, Scenario 3, Stalingrad Airlift. Now if you've seen my previous videos where I played through Scenario 1 and Scenario 2, this one is the next logical step for learning the wing leader system. The new additions to this scenario are going to be the escort mission and how escorts work in the game. And we're also going to have uh, an expert. And there's some heavy clouds or some dense cloud cover, which gives you some line of sight rules, environment stuff that will come into play. So in this scenario, what we've got is two German flights, uh, HE-111 bombers that are on a transport mission. I've got those set up here on the wing display with a transport mission and a bomb load. Now, the only difference between transport and bombing, it's essentially the same, except bombers never drop their bombs. They're more or less carrying cargo. But for all practical purposes, in the standard, uh, the non-advanced bombing rules, uh, nothing's different. They're just going to act like bombers. And they are going to be escorted by a single flight of BF-109s, the F-4 variant. And opposing them are two squadrons of Yak-1s, both green quality. So let's see how one flight of basically four BF-109s do against two squadrons of nine aircraft each. Remember, the max losses here indicates how many aircraft are in each squadron. So 18 Yak-1s trying to tackle four 109s and eight HE-111s split between two flights. Okay, so for setup for this one, German set up first, and the HE-111s set up at least five squares apart in columns I to O at altitude one. So I'm going to take these guys and set them up columns I to O at altitude one, and they have to be at least five squares apart. So one, two, three, four, five. And I'm gonna put them as close together as possible uh, because I've only got one flight of 109s to protect both. And the closer they are together, the easier it will be for this guy to detect them. Now, as we can see from this, BF-109 sets up as an escort. Now this is a new tasking that we need to explain. And basically escorts, they set up uh, escorting a formation or a single, in this case, a single bomber. And the rule book gives a little diagram of how they set up in relation to bombers. So if we are escorting a bomber, then the Escort's going to need to set up within three squares uh, a minimum, a max of one elevation below or a max of three altitude above, but not in front, not in front. So this escort that we're going to set up has to set up on one of these bombers within three squares, not above, not below. So I think to make the best use of this 109, we need to put him in a position where he can defend uh, these bombers. Now, the, the, the Russians are going to get to basically target one of these, and they don't set up until after we do, or the Germans. So I'm going to set up this fighter, one above, but three above this bomber. So he's going to be escorting this bomber. Now, I, I set him up this way because I want him to be as close to this one behind him to be able to tally them. If the, if the Soviets attack this one, then the German hopefully can spot them being only two behind. So, that's my setup. Now, escorts, they simply fly straight ahead, two squares each turn, just like bombers do. But they move before bombers. And if you notice on the movement order, right up here, the move order, it's kind of hard for you to see that. You've got 
dogfights move, then escorts before bombers. And that's important because I'll explain how reaction works uh, in this game. Now, I don't think I'm going to play this out um, tactically well for the Soviets because I want to demonstrate how escorts work. So I'm going to probably not make optimal choices for the Soviets just because I want to show you what happens here. All right, now the Soviets, they set up in formation in columns A to G or Q to Z. They get a choice here. And they can set up in, at any, any elevation. So I'm going to take my two Soviet squadrons here, and we're going to set them up in columns Q to Z. And we're just going to stick them... We're going to stick them up here. We're going to put... They have to be in formation. So we're going to put one here and one here. Q to Z. Put them at elevation two. And because they are on an intercept mission, they place vectors. So I'm just going to place these vectors uh, over here somewhere. Now, they're going to tally probably pretty quick, so it doesn't really matter at this point. Yeah, we'll put them a little closer. We don't want them to overfly their targets, so we'll put them right up there. Okay. All right, so that is our setup. We do get, according to the scenario, the Germans get a veteran and they get an expert marker and they can assign those to whoever they will. I've assigned those to the fighter here to give them the best chance to fend off these Soviet fighters. So here we go, turn number one. Turn number one, we have the tally phase first and raiders always tally before the, so, uh, the defenders, but I'm not going to tally with this guy because I'm going to uh, show you how reaction works. So this, this German is not going to make a tally attempt. So now it's the Soviets' turn to tally. We're going to have B here try to tally Z. So he is green. Let's see, we rolled a 1. So he rolls a 1. Uh, the Germans are on a radio net with GCI, so they do get a plus 1 for that, but he's green, so that's a minus 1. So it's an a net roll of one, and he fails to spot that bomber. So let's try for A back here. He's going to try to tally that bomber as well. And he rolls a four, plus one for GCI, minus one because he's green. So a net of four, one, two, three, which is greater than the distance, so that's a successful tally. Take his tally marker, place it on that bomber. Now we go to the movement phase. In the movement phase, escorts move first. So this guy on escort mission moves forward two, one, two. And then the bombers and the raiders uh, choice in the order. So this guy's going to move one, two. And then this guy's going to move one, two. Okay. Now, A is triggered to move because its tally target just moved. So it's going to fly one, to go here because he wants to attack from above. Um, and then he is going to pitch down like this and he's going to attempt to dive straight down on this bomber for the rest of his movement. Because remember, when you enter your tally target square, you must stop your movement point. Uh, all your movement points are consumed at that point. Now, at this point, as he's attempting to enter the target, there is an escort that's escorting this bomber. This fighter can attempt a reaction roll against this fighter before he enters the square. And again, this reaction roll is made at the point that the interceptor is trying to enter the escorted bomber's square. So it's a 2d6 roll for the fighter to see if he can successfully react. And if he can successfully react, he will stop that fighter from entering the bomber square and engage him in this square. And there's an, a lot of negatives that are gonna happen to that Soviet by being caught in combat while having tallied a target outside the square. He's gonna be the defender and this bomber's gonna get to go free. So let's go ahead and look at this chart. Right here, we're going to look at the backside escort reaction. 
So the German player is going to roll 2d6 and needs to score a 6 or higher to successfully react. Now, if he gets a late reaction result, then he will tally the Soviet and will attack him, but in the bomber square. So he doesn't stop the interceptors from attacking the bomber. He just gets involved. And the other thing that can happen is he could have no reaction result, which would be uh, he fails to tally, he fails to react, he just stays there, essentially. But he could make another reaction roll against another fighter later in the same turn. So let's go ahead and roll for reaction, 2d6. All right, and we get an 11. So looking at the modifiers, the escort squadron is a veteran, so that's a plus one, so we have 12. Uh, for each square, the escort is distant from the enemy. So at this point, and again, you measure it from the point where the interceptor is trying to enter. So not the distance to this square, the distance to this square. So one, two, three is the distance. So that's a minus three to the roll. So we go from 12 down three to nine. And that's basically it. These other ones don't apply. So it's a nine, which is a successful reaction. It's greater than six. So here we go. That stops him. D tallies, so I'm gonna put D's tally on here, or O, oh, I'm sorry, O's tally, on the Soviet squadron. And at this point, it's important to note that the tasking, when, once an escort tallies an enemy, it switches to a sweep tasking. So it's now considered on a sweep mission. It can later form back up as an escort, but at the moment it tallies, which in the case of this reaction it has, he becomes a sweet mission. The Soviet does not get to enter. Instead, this guy must take the most direct route and end his movement there. Now, he already moved. Remember, the escort moved first and then the bomber moved. He gets to make this second movement as an escort. So only escorts get to do this uh, to close the distance on this Soviet interceptor. So he moved to first to get himself in position relative to where the bomber would be at the end of its movement. Then when the Soviet tried to enter, reaction roll succeeded, he can move directly to the Soviet and attack him there. So there we go. There's the movement. Neither of them are marked climb or dive because they didn't do any of that. And then this last one to move is going to be this B. He did not have a tally, so he simply moves to his vector, and he's got two more movement points to use up, so he's just going to face down like this to give him a forward view on anything that's below him, and the vector comes off, and he's going to be kind of stuck here uh, unless he, he returns home or tallies. Now again, why is he facing down like this? It's not because he's diving. The facing in wing leader is more to do with direction of attention than it is to do with the direction the plane is flying. So the planes, excuse me. So his focus is down here and he's gonna have to hopefully tally next turn. All right, so we're done with the movement phase. We go to the combat phase. So we have the German fighter attacking against the squadron. Um, so number, number one reason, who's attacker, who's defender, if the one side does not have a tally on the other, they're automatically the defender. So this guy does not have a tally on O, he's got a tally on the bomber below him, which is not a part of the combat. So let's look at our stats here. The 109 versus the Yak. Stats are pretty much the same at this altitude, so we're just going to go with speed. So the German has a speed of six, plus one because he is um, a veteran, but minus one because he is a flight. So it's a net six. The Soviets have a speed of five, but they're green. So we're gonna put that down to a four. So essentially it's gonna be six versus four, which is going to be a plus two column roll for the Germans, a minus two column roll for the Soviets. So here we go with the German roll, plus two. Or it's on the plus two column. Okay, that's an eight. And he has an expert. Uh, so that expert is going to give him a plus one right there. 
Also, the attacker bounces the defender. Now, this is in the advanced rules for wing leader, but to me, it just should be standard rules because bouncing is a, a very important factor in wing leader. So, the reason it's a bounce is simply because the defender does not have, has a tally on a target outside his square. So that's one of the conditions for a bounce. If the defender has a tally on a target outside the square, then he is bounced. Simply, this is illustrating the fact that A had its focus on Z and got blindsided by these four 109 escorts. So we have a plus one from bounce, plus one for expert. So with the roll of eight plus two, that's a 10. 10 on the plus two column is two hits, okay? So now we're gonna resolve each of these hits with a 1d6 roll, adding the firepower of the 109, which is one, plus one for an expert. An expert gives you a plus one roll on these confirmation uh, or loss check rolls. So two for two hits, okay? A one is an automatic no effect, even though modifiers might make it a straggler. Disregard, because a one is automatically no effect. The four, plus one for firepower, plus one for expert is a six. The protection rating of the yak is only a four, so this is a loss inflicted. Let me stick that on A's wing display. So A now has a loss. Now we roll for the Soviets. They roll on the minus two column. And they score a seven, uh, minus one because they were bounced. Um, gives us a six, which is no hits on the minus two column. Now we go to cohesion. So let's roll for the uh, let's roll for the attackers cohesion check. So the Germans roll to be six, and they get a six. Now they are veterans, so that's plus one, and they are the attacker in the combat, so that's plus one. So they pass their cohesion check, but they are marked with a minus one low ammo marker. And now we're gonna roll for the Soviets cohesion check, and they roll a three, that's pretty bad. Three minus one for having a loss, minus one for being green, that's a one. That is two levels of disruption, which will break these Soviets. So they lose their mission marker, their mark broken, they will have to return home and they no longer have a tally on anything. Though at the conclusion of this combat, A would have had to take their tally off the bomber and put it on the 109s. Again, that happens at the end of the combat. They didn't have a tally on them, but as a result of the combat, you better believe their attention is now gonna be on those 109s. So, there we go. That was our combat. We don't check for dogfight because um, one side is broken. No dogfight's going to happen. All right, admin phase. Um, at this point for admin phase, uh, we could remove broken squadrons if both sides agreed. And we're going to go ahead and do that. We're going to uh, remove, we're going to let this squadron escape. Reason being, the Germans don't want to follow around these broken yaks. They want to follow after the remaining threat to protect the transports. So we're just going to go ahead and take those guys off because these guys are going to try to tally the fighters at the end, at the, at the, on the next tally phase. So we'll take off his tally marker. All right, turn two. Here we go. So far, these 109s, these veterans, are doing a stellar job of protecting the transports, HE-111s. All right, turn two, tally phase. Germans get to tally first, and we are going to have O try to tally these yaks behind him. Rolls a four, minus, uh, minus one for the enemy being behind. Oh, minus two, my bad. Not that, that did not change. Okay, minus two, target is behind the squadron. Plus one because they're veteran. So this is going to be a successful tally. So, all right, let's get O's tally mark marker back on 
these yaks. Now the yaks, they're going to try and tally these bombers because they're closer and he wants to ensure that he's the attacker for this combat. So here he goes, he's gonna roll, try to tally those bombers. <clears throat> That's a terrible roll. We're going to say he successfully tallies because we already gave them a disadvantage by doing a not so good setup because we wanted to demonstrate escort. So we're gonna just say that these guys successfully tallied these guys for demonstration purposes. All right, now we go to the movement phase. Escorts move first. We don't have escorts anymore. Remember the fighters, uh, the 109s having tallied um, the broken other yaks, um, they switched their tasking to intercept or to uh, sweep. So they're no longer an escort. So no escorts. We do have bombers. They move next. So we're going to have this guy move and then this guy move. One, two. All right. That triggers the X movement because they have a tally on him. So he's got three movement points plus one if he's going to dive, which he is. So he's going to go one, two, and then three. And we're marking him with a dive marker. That triggers O's movement because O has a tally on them. So he is going to go one, two, and he's going to dive in as well. All right, combat. So we have bombers involved in the combat. So automatically the bomber side is the defender for this combat. So the yaks get to choose whether to do speed or turn. They have the same stats again, so they may as well do speed because they get to make use of that dive. And they also avoid the plus two defense rating to the HE-111, which would go from zero to two. So they want to go with speed. So a speed of five. Uh, plus one for diving, minus one because they're green, so it stays at five. And... The Germans get to choose whether to use the stats, have the bombers or the fighters as their primary combatant. And obviously they're gonna choose the 109s as they have the better stats. Their speed is six, plus one for dive, plus one for veteran. So that's up to an eight, but minus one because they're a flight, so it drops down to seven. So it's seven versus five. So it's gonna be again, plus two, minus two. So let's roll for the Soviets first on the minus two column. Eh, that's pretty bad, no hits. Okay, and the Germans on the plus two, four, plus one for the expert is a five. Uh, on the plus two column, that is no hits. Yes, no hits, no hits whatsoever, okay. So a lot of bullets fired. Let's see how the nerves of the pilots held up in that combat. So let's roll for the Soviets cohesion roll. Oh, they roll high. So they are going to pass their cohesion check and we're gonna mark them with a low ammo marker. And the Germans, let's roll for the, let's roll for the bombers first. Let's see how they, how they do. Okay, six. Now that would be bad for fighters, but bombers use a different cohesion column so six with uh, is no 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 cohesion here um so they don't get marked with an ammo marker bombers never do unless they're strafing but not in this one let's roll for the 109s that's bad okay they roll a four plus one for being veteran but minus one because they have a low ammo marker so they break so finally, the Soviets will get a chance to pay back unmolested by the Germans. So O is going to flee the battle here. They lose their tally. And that's the conclusion of combat. We don't check for we don't check for dogfight because one side is broke. Uh, the fighters are broken here. These guys are. Admin phase will remove these guys. The Soviets don't care about the fighters. They're after the bombers. All right, here we go. Turn three. Turn three. 
uh, tally phase. Soviets are going to keep their tallies as is. Let's go to the movement phase. Bombers move first. They're going to go one, two. Now, the Soviets, to give themselves the best chance for a combat here, they're going to climb. They're going to climb up here and go one, two, three to get up and above the bombers. Okay. Now we got to move these guys too. Go to combat, no combat, end of the turn. We're now on turn four. Tally phase, everything stays the same. Movement phase, here we go. One, two. All right, now the Soviets. They are going to dive in on this combat. All right, here we go. They're going to go one and two, dive in for the kill. All right, now, one thing to consider is that the sun is in the upper left, so the Soviets could set up a bounce here, except I'm not too certain at this point if the dense clouds block that attempt. Well, let me see. Bounce. Bounce, bounce, bounce. Okay, the defender is a fighter and is attacking the primary combatant out of the sun. 4.6.2 in the sun. Sun in the sun, okay. Okay, if a target is in the sun, take the line of sight to the enemy and extend it to the edge of the map. If this extended line of sight is blocked, for example, by higher cloud layers, the target is in fact not in the sun. Okay, so line of sight. So with these dense clouds, we didn't talk about this, dense clouds will block line of sight out of or through. So for instance, um, let's say we had a fighter here in this square. He can see the bombers, the bombers or the, the squadron here can see them but we move another squadron here, there is no line of sight. The dense clouds blocks it. So basically the rules say, take a, a line and trace it from in the sun arc, trace it from uh, the bomber to the target. And if that line crosses any cloud layers that block line of sight, then this is not going to be out of the sun. So no bounce here, no bounce. Okay, so just a straight up diving combat here. We have the Yaks attacking with a speed of five, plus one dive, minus one green, so it's five. The bombers are defending with a speed of four, minus one because they are a flight, and minus one because they're carrying a cargo load. So their speed drops to a two. So five versus two, that is plus three, minus three. Now, had we not climbed up and then dived to set up that combat, this would have been uh, a plus two, minus two. It's important, remember, to make every combat count. These yaks are green, and they sh you know, should have disrupted in that last cohesion roll, but they didn't. So the likelihood of them passing unscathed this next cohesion check is pretty unlikely. So you need to make every combat count with your squadrons, regardless of their veteran or green or average or whatever. So here we go, plus three, minus three. Let's roll for the Soviets first. Plus three column. They roll a seven. No modifiers to this roll. So that is simply one hit. One hit on the plus three column. So let's roll to do a loss check. 1d6 for the one hit, adding a firepower of one. They roll a six, which is an automatic kill. So one HE 111 goes down. Now let's roll for the Germans on the minus three column. They roll a seven, that is no hits. Now we roll cohesion, let's roll for the Soviets. They're all important cohesion roll. They roll, yes, ta-da. Case and point made. Three, plus one because they're the attacker. 
minus one because they are green, minus one because they uh, have a low ammo marker, that is two levels of disruption, so they break. All right, so that's basically the end of the scenario, though we do need to see how the German bombers fared. Let's see their cohesion roll. They pass. Eight minus one loss is seven. They pass their cohesion check. Okay, end of the scenario. So let's look at the victory conditions. Um, right here, we need to subtract the Soviet VPs from the German VPs. So the Germans, they score three victory points for every flight that makes it off the map, flight of bombers, that is. So that's six for those two sets of bombers. And then they also scored another one victory point for this one loss. So that's a total of seven victory points. The, Germ uh, the Soviets scored one kill on the HE-111s. That's two victory points, as you can see there, two VP. So the score is seven to two. So we take seven, subtract two, and that gives us five. So it is a German victory. And that, that feels right. That feels right. The German seven, I should, yeah, seven German HE-111s make it to Stalingrad and help relieve the besieged soldiers there. Okay, well, that's pretty much it. Um, I hope the demonstration of escort rules was a help. Um, one thing to make note of, and let me just kind of clear this so we can make some demonstrations again. Um, if we had both these bombers in formation, the German escort can set up as an escort for this entire formation, and he can set up in that three square distance limit, one below, not in front kind of setup. He can set up basically anywhere in that area in relation to either of these bombers. So he could set up way back here, one, two, three, one, two, three. He could set up way up here and be considered escorting all of these guys because he fits in that area limit for this bomber that's in formation with this bomber. But typically what you'll want is you'll want these guys to either be within one, above. Uh, I like to put them one above simply because it keeps them separate uh, from these guys so they're not in formation. That way enemies don't get a bonus trying to tally these guys, um, and especially when wing leaders come into play and all that, which I demonstrated in my last video. But let's say this guy successfully tallies. Well, let me, let me do a, let me just illustrate what would happen on a failed tally roll. So let's say this guy is trying to attack these bombers. This guy's going to react. And let's say he rolls a, a, a five or a four or something like that with modifiers. That would be considered a late reaction. So this guy would make it in, but then this guy would immediately place a tally and must. This is a must. If you are a late reaction or a successful reaction, the escort must enter. So if you didn't want this guy to actually do it, you know, if you roll and you're like, oh, late reaction, ah, I don't want to, you know, do that. I'm going to wait and see if I can successfully react against another squadron incoming. No, no, no. If it's a late reaction, he's got to go in for the, for the combat. So he would come in here and attack. Now, let's say we beat off the Soviets. All's good. Now, during the next movement phase, this guy could say, he's going to form up as a escort. So he chooses a square that's going to be in uh, in escort range uh, according to that setup uh, in relation to the bombers. So he's going to say, all right, I'm going to set up as an escort here next turn. So then during the movement phase, this guy moves here, this guy moves here, this guy moves to the spot he chose as the form up point to reform up as an escort. Then in the admin phase, of that turn, he can then switch his mission from sweep back to escort, and voila, he is ready to go to react against another threat inbound. Escorts are very dangerous, except when attackers or interceptors come in from the head-on. If these yaks had chosen, which might have been a better strategy, um, if they are entering the bomber square from head-on, 
head on from here or here or here, no reaction is possible. The escorts cannot react against an incoming threat that is head-on. Now remember, head-on combats are hard to score hits because there's going to be a minus two uh, to the combat roll um, for head-on conditions, but it may allow you to still engage combat with the bombers and avoid getting reacted against by the escorts. And even though you may not score any hits, you are forcing a cohesion roll on the bombers, which is your kind of primary way of disrupting or of gaining victory points or taking away uh, denying victory points to the raider player. So if this yak had tried to re, uh, enter from head on, no reaction. Um, now another tactic to note is that escorts escorts can only react if they are quote unquote available. And that is a definition in the rule book. Available means that they are not broken or dis uh, not broken, that they do not have a tally on an enemy. I think I'm. I'm gonna hold on before I before I put my foot in my mouth. Let me double check that. Available. Yeah, a fighter squadron is available if it is unbroken, does not occupy the same square as an enemy squadron that has tallied it. Okay, so never mind about the tally thing. If this guy is unbroken and there is no enemy that has a tally on him in the same square, then he is available. Now, if this, say this Russian, had a tally on him and this fighter had a tally on the bombers, then during the movement phase, let's just say this was the movement, one, two, the escorts had moved one, two first, now the Soviets get to move. Well, actually, hold on. Let me do this in order so you can see what's happening here. Okay, so first to move would be escorts. One, two. That triggers this guy. He's going to move in and engage those or tie up these fighters. Okay, this, this escort is no longer available because he is in the same square as an enemy that has him tallied. All right, now this would not be, this would not make him unavailable because the axe don't have a tally on him. But because the axe have a tally on him, he is now unavailable and unable to react. So then these bombers move, one, two, that triggers this guy, and he doesn't need to attack head on to avoid being reacted against because this guy is now unavailable to react. So he can just come up here from above or over here, or set up a bounce, whatever. So that's one a good tactic to use as the as the interceptors is have a squadron tie up or busy up a, an escort so that the other guys can get the best attack possible. That's not always possible. Uh, a lot of times there's going to be more escorts than or the same number of escorts as interceptors and you really can't do that. But you can split your squadrons into flights in some scenarios and that might help you uh, allocate your resources to ensure better escort uh, deterrent. All right. Well, that was a short scenario and I hope it was a good illustration, uh, and maybe helped with some rules clarifications. If you have any questions about this, if I got something, uh, uh, went over something quickly that you didn't understand, let me know in the comments and this will come up more in future scenarios and, and maybe more strategies. If I go, if I continue playthroughs of other scenarios, you'll see even more how that works. And the next scenario, especially penny packets, is a good one because there's a lot of escorts, or there's escorts, sweep, and a lot of interceptors. And that'll be a, another good illustration of all this. So hope that helped. Uh, post in the comments below if you have any questions or comments or have a suggestion for a topic for another video. Thanks for watching.